Hey carnivores, SP fam, welcome back to the channel. It's me, Bella the Steak and Butter Gal. I hope you guys are having a beautiful day. Today, we are all in for a treat because I will be inviting on my guest, the Dr. Joan Ifland, who wrote the textbook on food addiction to come on and explain to you guys what foods are actually killing you guys, how to age in reverse, how to live longer, why and how food addictions happen, and of course, how we can successfully overcome food addiction forever. She also teaches us her fail-proof techniques on how to stop overeating and how to always stay on track despite the holidays coming up. I also want to share that Dr. Ifland will be visiting my November challenge meetings on November 12th, which is Friday here in the States at 5 p.m. Pacific time. So if you guys want to attend this live hour-long Zoom call featuring Dr. Ifland where she answers all of our questions, please do sign up for the November challenge. You guys can join these monthly challenges anytime throughout the month, but I would highly recommend that you sign up now so that you don't miss the guest meetings coming up. And finally, before I invite on Dr. Ifland, I wanted to shout out and thank ButcherBox for collaborating with me to bring you guys free Turkey Friday. Thanksgiving is coming up turkeys are going to be needed for dinner. If you guys sign up with ButcherBox as a first time member, you will get a 10 to 14 pound turkey free in your ButcherBox shipped right to your door. If you guys want to claim this promo, I will make sure to link it down below in the description box. Not only will you get a free turkey in your first ButcherBox, but you will get $100 off for the first five months. So $20 off for the first five months of your ButcherBox purchases. Claim it down in the description box. I'm going to be cooking it at 325 for three hours. We'll check in three hours. So three hours later, here is the finished product of the turkey. As you guys can see, I cooked it in nothing but its own fat. No seasoning, no sauces, no brine, nothing but the turkey itself. And it turned out perfect. Smoking, piping hot. I have to share my taste test because this is my first time ever, ever, ever eating turkey. Let's do this. This turkey is the bomb. It is so good. You know what it reminds me of? Beijing kaoya, the Beijing roasted duck. It has that rich, deep flavor um, of duck meat, and it's way more intense than chicken meat. I made a Thanksgiving turkey completely carnivore. Zero sugar, zero sauces, zero marinade. It turns out just as perfect and delicious. Cooked in nothing but its own fat. I didn't season it, I didn't even salt it. I literally just put in the raw turkey, cooked it, and it turned out this delicious. Sign up link is going to be down below where you guys can claim the free Turkey Friday promo. Okay, let's get into the video with Dr. Ifland. Hi, Dr. Ifland, welcome. Hi, hi Bella, thanks for having me. How does food addiction even start? And is everyone able to build an addiction to food? People think, oh, you have to have the genetic predisposition, but that is not true. Any animal can be addicted to any substance if you start them young enough mm. and you give them the substance often enough. So anyone can get it. 20% of people have the genetic predisposition towards addiction, but we see that well over 70% of Americans are now overweight or obese. Mm. So what has happened is that the environment has taken precedence, it's overwhelmed the genetic predisposition. And now it's the environment is the biggest factor. Well, I have an MBA from Stanford, yes, it's 40 years ago, but I understand the impact of business models. The addiction business model is a very specific model. You can sell a harmful product. You can create a great deal of delusion about this harmful product like cigarettes. Mm. And you can persuade people to buy it enough times that the reward center in the brain starts pumping out so much addictive neurotransmitter that you become a slave to those brain cells. And it can happen to anybody. So when you use the word substances, I suddenly remember hearing that sugar is just as addictive, if not more than cocaine. What is the science behind how these processed foods get us hooked? There are two major pieces of science. One is what are the substances themselves? Mm -hmm. And two is how does the food industry trigger cravings? So you have to work both pieces. 
to really get peace, to really get uh, this addiction into remission. One of the reasons why this addiction is so hard to put into remission is there are a lot of different substances. Mm. And each substance is addicting a different region of the brain. So if you just have one substance, like you just have alcohol, you just have nicotine, you only have one region of the brain to put into remission, to get those cells to stop hyperactivating. But with processed foods, you've got all four. You've got serotonin and dopamine and opiate and cannabinoid. A lot of people cannot start working on getting rid of the substances because they're actually being driven crazy by the triggering, the cueing, the stimulation, the messaging, the reminders. Mm-hmm. Until you can get that to settle down, you can't get control of your food because these addicted brain cells are pumping out neurotransmitters that are controlling your behavior. So your behavior is being controlled back in the reward center. Everybody thinks their behavior is controlled by their frontal lobe. Frontal lobe is only 2% of the brain. Mm. The addicted brain cells, because we're addicted really from conception, they have control. All you have to do is remind them of one of those substances. We call it the zombie walk. You're walking to the kitchen. You're walking to get in your car. Your frontal lobe is screaming, no, no, no. And you just keep going. Mm. That is the battle between the addicted brain cells and the frontal lobe. I see. So when the addiction is this deeply ingrained, whether it be from trauma or just habit building our whole life, going through this routine, what is the solution? How do we break such deep habits? You have to use a different part of the brain. The most powerful part of the brain is keeping us breathing and our blood pumping. But right next to that is mirror neurons, conformance drive. We need to fit in. We need to belong. Why? Because for all the time that humans were evolving, if your tribe was nearby, you're seven or eight or 12 people, you would live. A predator could come along, you could run and get the protection of your tribe. They would know where to find food. They would know how to keep an eye on the children. Your genes would get passed on if you identified with a tribe, if you copied your tribe, if you did what your tribe was doing, if you identified with your tribe, if you stuck close to your tribe, you your genes would get passed on. The person who was t- you know tended to wander off by themselves, the wild animals would get them. They would not survive. The genetics for belonging are really the most powerful part of the brain. Now the food industry knows this. So this is why they're constantly putting uh, images in front of us of people eating processed foods uh-huh. because our 98% of the brain doesn't know that that's not happening. So the trick is to get the frontal lobe to control the messaging that reaches the rest of the brain. If you can get the, the lying and the deception, oh, but this is so yummy. Mm-hmm. Oh, you know, cigarettes are sexy. And, the, and alcohol for 12 year olds, that, that's really cool. All that deception, all that incredibly destructive deception, the frontal lobe can control that not reaching the 98% of the brain. And that's how you control the addiction. Don't let the food industry stimulate those brain cells. And after a while, they quiet down. Wow. So basically your solution is to find a tribe to belong to. Mm-hmm. What if someone is so isolated or they're living with a family who is literally yes so what is the solution around that and this is exactly what i started addressing i turned in the manuscript for the textbook in 2017 at the end of that year i learned about zoom oh okay Zoom. so we uh, have an online community Mm. Uh, we're worldwide this is a very very complex addiction and peeling back All of those substances is something that can take a year or two. We offer 15 hours a day of live programming. You can be on a Zoom screen with a live person. We do a lot, a lot, a lot of training. Only 2% of the brain knows that that's a screen. The other 98% of the brain says, oh, there's our tribe. There's our tribe. There's our tribe. So if the viewer who's watching this video, if they would like to join this Zoom community, could I just link it down below in the description box and they sign Mm -hmm. up? Processfoodaddiction.com. Amazing. And I actually have to share with you, I started this myself, like a whole Zoom community. And my reason was 
during COVID, I became extremely lonely and I, I just graduated from Juilliard with a piano degree and I, oh, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Doing gigs, performing live, and then it all stopped. And I yeah. honestly became very depressed and I didn't know what to do with my life. All I yeah. knew was eating meat after being vegan for so long, it changed my life and it brought back my health. So I mm -hmm. thought maybe I can spend my many hours at home making some YouTube videos. And then a lot of my viewers started saying, you should start a support group because we would all love to hang out. I started the support group and it started flourishing into Zoom meetings of us just talking, hanging out, talking about what we're eating, how we're feeling. And to this day, we continue to have these meetings every month. And yeah. Dr. If Flint, you will be my guest in November. So I'm extremely excited to actually feature you as a guest so you, you can share your knowledge. But yeah, Thank you. it's very fascinating to know the science behind how effective it is to have a tribe. So now this leads me to my question, what is the definition of processed foods? Because a lot of my viewers are carnivore, they eat an animal-based diet, and there are certain foods that we question if it's processed. For example, collagen powder. What exactly should we avoid when it comes to processed foods? So what you are looking for is something that no longer looks like it did at the moment of harvest. Gotcha, okay. So yes, you can apply heat, but if you were to take a slice of bacon, cooked, ready to eat, mm -hmm. and look at that same slice of bacon at the moment of harvest, you, you would be able to see, oh, this is that. It gotcha. still looks the same. Mm -hmm. But if you took collagen powder, your body isn't going to have a clue what that is. Right. So okay. If you were to eat um, an animal product that contained collagen, Oh, your body would know exactly how to extract it and package it up for your use. But when something has been powdered, it's concentrated. And even though your gut can recognize hundreds of thousands of substances, it's just, you know, it's just, you know, eat the animal product. Back to the food addiction, let's say somebody is on the right path to overcoming it, finally building good habits, they found a tribe to belong to, but one day something stressful happens and they become emotional and they need that comforting food and they resort back into it. In that moment, what can we do? Brain cells are really hyperactive anyway, like they're constantly moving around and they have these connectors and they're touching each other and sending chemicals to one another. And this is how thoughts are formed, behaviors, feelings happen. What the food industry has been able to do, it's been able to teach those brain cells, stress means go get processed foods. Maybe you are stressed and then you go get something that makes it worse because it's been advertised as making it better. Comfort food. Well, this is the same thing as advertising cigarettes as being sexy. They've done the same thing with processed foods. So processed foods are comforting. No, they elevate adrenaline levels. They wear the brain out. They make us tired. They make us depressed. So instead of these two cells saying to each other, oh yeah, let's go get some processed foods. We'll numb out on processed foods. Yeah. You train those brain cells to connect differently. And they say, oh, processed foods. Well, that will make us sick. That'll make us feel worse. Yes. So let's go find some friends and check in with our friends, reliably sympathetic friends, like not friends that are going to try to fix you or not friends that are going to tell you it was your fault anyway, mm. or not friends that are going to make you feel bad. Yes. But friends who are going to really lift you up. Your brain is like a lot of countries and you get into the stress country. Well, all you need to do is a training to move back over into, you know, no, 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 I'm, I'm confident. I'm capable. I'm calm. I'm so I will do some self-kindness into that part of your brain. The rational part of your brain it takes training, repetition. Mm -hmm. So when you repeat again and again, oh man, that makes me sick. That makes me sick. That makes me sick. That highway is open. It's wider than the let's go get some processed foods. It takes a lot of time. And it takes being community that recognizes the truth. Plus, the cool thing is community releases another fantastic neurotransmitter called oxytocin. You know, you're depleted on your dopamine because of the processed food addiction, dopamine, serotonin, endocannabinoid, and opiate are all like just not very reliable they're easily depleted. 
They can easily drop you off. You get high and then you crash. Mm. Well, oxytocin is not that way. You just get among your friends, people who are reliably kind, and you'll get a big old oxytocin release and you're like, okay, I'm okay now. Once you know how to stimulate the release of feel-good neurotransmitters, it's a different life. That makes sense. So what if holidays are coming up? We have to be in situations, circumstances where the person next to us is literally eating pie or just junk. So in that situation, what would you advise to do? Send the emails now. Please don't offer me processed foods. Please don't encourage me to eat them. Please don't shame me for not eating them. Yes. Like, oh, you can have one bite if you wanted to. I made it just for you. Just like, no. Yes. I don't want to talk about food. I am working on a an allergy food plan rotation and I have to bring my own food. Love it. You, yeah. can, you can do that. But here's the cool thing you can do. You can write a play about the day. And what are you doing? You are training your brain how to react in a very special situation. So you know how plays start out with, you know, here's the setting. Uh, this is the time of day. This is the time of year. This is the city. Those are all cues. Oh. Those are all triggers. So what you want is you want to teach your brain how to react to those triggers. Mm -hmm. So you say, okay, here's the setting. I get in my car. I drive to this place. Maybe you don't want to talk to everybody there. Because maybe so-and-so always says something horrible. Mm -hmm. So in your play, you write up, well, I talk to her and I talk to him and I talk to her and then I leave. Uh-huh. Or, um, you know, I stay for the meal. I have my own food or I've worked it out that all I'm going to eat is the, the protein. I sit down at the table. I eat with everybody. And before the desserts come out, I leave. I've seen everybody, I've appeared, I've had my holiday, I've connected with all the people that I wanted to connect with, go home. And then you write the play about the next day, because often it's something called the post-apocalyptic meltdown, oh. where you get home and phew, oh, the guard is down, oh, I worked so hard, now I'm exhausted, and I deserve a reward. And boom, you lose it then. Yeah. So you write the play for how you drive home. You've got clean food waiting for you at home. Right. You eat that clean food. You work a jigsaw puzzle. You know, you call your mom on the other side of the world and you go to bed. You get it. You have a great novel waiting for you and you go to bed. And then even the next day, mm. the next day I have these events planned. I have this food planned. It's all ready. And uh, I go hiking for the day. You have actually a planning center in your brain. Once you have filed a flight plan there, it's shocking. You yeah. write it down. You write it down a couple of weeks in advance. Read it over and over and over again. Because every time you read it, you're reinforcing those brain cells, which means that the stronger a set of brain cells are, the more likely they are to dominate Mm. and control behavior. It's a great avenue to really enjoying the day. What happens is now, oh, there's this room to enjoy the other people. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yes. I mean, a lot of people have had these conversations where you, you look like you're paying attention, but what are you really thinking about? Oh my gosh, I saw five pies out there and I'm going to, how am I going to have a piece of each one plus the Da, 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 da. But, and you're not really connecting with the person because the cravings are dominating your brain. I am in control of the situation. I decide what I eat. I decide how I'm going to feel. I decide who I'm going to talk to. My last question is, and this is something that I heard you say in your birthday workshop. I was there and I was listening. Oh, yes. I enjoyed it very much. And your beginning presentation, you said that you make sure you build a healthy lifestyle and diet so you can live longer and spend more time with your grandchildren because that brings yeah. you happiness. And that really touched me. So I would love to ask, what are some top daily practices that you do every day or just tips that you can share with us on how to live longer, but also to live our best lives? Yeah, yeah. Don't wait until you're 70 to start <laughs> connecting with my family and having a really lovely time. The emotional stability mm. of not eating these processed foods is priceless. It's really, that's the piece that got me into this 26 years ago. I'm 70. I'm 70 a couple of days ago. I'm healthier today than I was 10 years ago. 
Wow. I'm healthier at age 70 than I was at age 60. I was healthier at 60 than 50, healthier at 50 than 40. I mean, I just keep getting healthier and healthier, stronger. Mm. I sleep better. I move around better. I think better. The most amazing thought I had during my birthday was, huh, I wonder if I'll be healthier at 80 than I am at 70. Mm. So the things to do are create great self-awareness. When am I hurting? When am I in pain? What am I actually feeling? What are my limiting beliefs? We are totally the sum total of our beliefs. And our beliefs come from the people around us. Mm. Am I hanging out with people who expect to be vibrant through the end of their lives? Or am I hanging out with people who expect to be in a lot of pain with a lot of medications and hospital visits? Like that was my parents' uh, end of life. Medications, frequent visits to the doctor. They had no meditation practice. Mm -hmm. Uh, My mom lived to be 92 and my dad was 87, but they weren't really for the 10 last 10 years of their lives. They were not happy. They were in pain from various diet related problems Mm -hmm. and they couldn't change. Don't fall for this thing about uh, cheat days and treats. Okay. Processed foods are about 10 times more damaging than cigarettes. So just somehow get it very, very deep on the inside that every bite hurts. Mm. Every bite hurts. Every bite is making it hard for your cells to work. And so they're dying. If they, if they are overstressed, they will die. So a number one, really pay attention to your food. A number two is pay attention to the people you're hanging around with. Mm. Mirror neurons, we started down this conversation, mirror neurons will copy. They're just radar. They're automatic radar. What are they doing? Oh, they're sick and going to the hospital. Okay, we'll be sick and go to the hospital too. If you are around people who don't eat this stuff, who get outside a lot, if you're around people who are reading, who are writing and are happy and are productive, people who are angry and depressed Uh, their cells are not working that well. You want to be around people who are dancing, making music, singing, making art. They're engaged. Their frontal lobe is engaged. That is totally the way that you avoid the development of dementia and Alzheimer's. Wow. These these things are incredibly, totally, 100% avoidable. So I was um, hit by a van almost two years ago. And um, I had a a neurological evaluation as a result. And the the person who did it said, this is what you need to work on. Cognitive restoration is what it's called. Whatever brain cells you stimulate will get blood supply and nourishment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they will not die away because they're active. Yes. So keep your brain stimulated. Never, ever, ever diet. Don't Mm -hmm. ever. Don't ever not eat enough food because then you're waking up the fear of famine uh, brain. Main thing, main thing, main thing is to look at the people around you. For 70, you are vibrant. You are so, so sharp. Like you look absolutely phenomenal. Thank you. I feel phenomenal. I mean, yes, I am wrinkling up here. I kind of like smudge up my camera. So you see it. (laughs) But the cool thing is, is I feel younger on the inside. Yes. And now that I have developed this breathing technique, I am really clear Mm -hmm. that my asthma is going to go away fully, full remission. It's gotten better over the years, but now I I see a clear pathway to just making it go away. I'm going to be better when I get to be 80. Absolutely, you will. Dr. Ifland, you inspire me so much. And I have to thank you from the bottom of my heart for spending the time with me, sharing your knowledge. Thank you. Thank you, Bella. You are doing so much good in the world. That was brilliant. You're in quarantine. You're lonely. Boom. I'm going to figure out how to fix this. Thank you. And you do so much good. That's the way it works. 
Thank you guys so much for watching the video. Please don't forget to hit like, subscribe, and turn on those bell notifications. Again, Dr. Joan Ifland will be my guest on November 12th at 5 p.m. Pacific time. If you would like to attend her guest meeting where she will answer all of our questions, please sign up below for the November challenge. Once you sign up, you will also have access to every single meeting, including all three guest meeting playbacks. I will see you guys in the next video. SVG out.